John 13, verses 34 and 35. A new command I give you, love one another, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this all men will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. That's our scripture readings this morning, and young children may be dismissed for children's church. Good morning. Well, I decided to do a short scripture reading today for one reason, was so that when I ask some of the other guys when Barry's gone fishing, that you won't be as scared because you won't think I'm giving you four or five uh, chapters to read, okay? Let's start with prayer. Father, we thank you so much for all that you do for us, for loving us so passionately and pursuing us faithfully, Father. No matter what happens, you love us and you show that love wholeheartedly to us, dear Lord. We thank you for this day. I pray that your spirit is upon this place and that the words that you have us to hear today, Father, that we will take home and that we will put into practice so that we can be better lights for you, dear Lord, that others may see our good works and it may glorify you in heaven. We thank you today, Father, for it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Love. I've preached about that before, and that's kind of the story that we heard today so far in the songs and everything, that we have love for one another. Love is the reason and motivation for the story. And today's message is called Writing Your Story. We talked last week about what God's story was and the elements of the story. But the motivation for God writing that story is how much He loves us. It means everything. So let's look at the verse again. The verses, John 13, 34, and 35. A new command I have given you. Love one another. As I have loved you. So we're supposed to imitate that. So you must love one another. And by this, all men will know that you're my disciples. And then Jesus repeats it again, if you love one another. When Jesus wrote, or when this was written down by John, Jesus had just got through with washing the disciples' feet, showing them an act of service, how that they should serve. The God of all the universe in humanly form washed the feet of His disciples. And that was back in a time, remember, when they wore sandals or they went barefoot. I've been wearing sandals most of the summer. My feet are permanently stained. I can't get them clean enough. The, my heels are getting calluses on them. I can just imagine what their feet were like. And we lived in, they lived in a city where there wasn't good sanitation and stuff. Animals running around the city. So very likely they didn't have just dirt on their feet. They had other remnants on their feet. And Jesus washed their feet to show them the act of service. And then in that um, chapter he goes on to tell Peter that, you know, not to be pompous, you will deny me. So he rebukes Peter and everything. Then he comes into this and says, a new command I give you. Well, it was new because he wanted to know, them to know that it wasn't by righteous living from the law that they were going to be saved, but because of reconciliation through Him. He predicted His death and everything. So it's not a dissolving of the old law by any means, but it's a new command so you could get new focus. And in that passage, He said that they should love one another three different times. So whenever you hear Jesus say, Hey, listen, you know, and, or you hear something repeated several times, it must be important, right? So I didn't feel that there was any need to do much other scripture this morning. This kind of sums it up. Also, it says it's a command. It's not a suggestion. It's not something we should do, but it's a command. And there are commands all throughout the New Testament. Thing is, is we don't want to take them as commands so many times. We like the one that says what we want to agree with, but the one that doesn't say what we want to agree with or is a little uncomfortable for us, we take that more as a suggestion. We think that it was a suggestion rather than a command. But Jesus is clear. A new command I give you, and He gives it to you. So it has authority, His authority, to love one another. And if there's any question of how that is, then He says, as I have loved. So there is no question. That means that you love one another, everyone, strongly enough that you're willing to give up everything that you have. Because Jesus gave up His heavenly throne and came to His creation to earth to love an insignificant human race 
that rejected Him, that turned their back all throughout history on Him, that saw the miracles of God when He walked with them, and they still denied Him so many times. But He came, left His throne, gave up everything to come down and live that example. Not only did He do that, but He taught one another. He lived by example. He prepared. He prayed. He spent time in God's Word, seeking the Father's will. And then He died for us. So that's the example of how He loved. And we're supposed to love as I have loved you. And He did that for each and every one of us. Not just for the righteous, but for the people that were lowly scum of life. He did it for all of us. Then it goes on to say, you must love one another. So he says it again. If you didn't catch the word command, he now says you must. It's a requirement. If you're going to follow me, if you're going to be my disciple, you have to love one another. And that's tough because we're all guilty. We find that person, whoever he or she is, and probably more than one person, unlovable. It's tough for us. But Jesus was clear here. We must love them. Why? By this, by doing that, all men will know that you're my disciples. So if we don't do that, what will they know? That you're not my disciples? That's the opposite side of the coin. So if we don't love, then maybe that's where the phrase comes from, well, I would have became a Christian if I wouldn't have known one. Or I would go to church if I didn't know that that person went to church. Think about that. And I'm not pointing fingers because every time you point, there's three pointed back at you. Remember that. I am guilty of it so many times. But Jesus' words are clear. And hopefully they'll prick your heart. He says it again. They'll know if you love one another. So he's very clear. Here's a God that wants to reveal himself, that loves you so much that he would send his son to earth to be an example and to die for you. He's not a mystery. He doesn't not want to be found. He came to you offering reconciliation. The law taught it, but now Jesus lived it. Righteous living alone is not enough. You've got to be obedient. You've got to live like Jesus. You've got to have a wholehearted heart like we talked about. Solomon before sought God half-heartedly. And at the end of his life, he wrote down that he chased after vain and foolish folly. And he had everything. He even had wisdom. God gave him more wisdom than any other man. But Satan was still able to deceive him. Caleb, on the other hand, that we looked at as an example, followed God wholeheartedly. He believed even though the rest of the people around him, the entire nation of Israel, said, no, we can't conquer this land. The giants are too big. Caleb said... God promised He would. And it's not by our power or might that we'll fight these giants and win. It's by God's might and power we will. You're right. There's a lot of things you can't do in life. If you don't think you are, you'll realize that that's the the case. There's so many things that we can't face. But God has given us His power and might, especially if you're a Christian, through the empowering of His Spirit to bring about mighty acts that you guys never knew that you could do. Not so that you can boast, but that you can say, look who my God is. Because I am nothing, but by His power, I was able to do this. I'm up here today. I wouldn't be up here if it wasn't for His empowering, period. It'd be so much easier to say, no, not me. I know that I should love one another. I know that I should preach the gospel message, but uh, surely there's someone else. Moses did it. God came to him and said, Go, free my people. He said, "Uh, Not me, God. And he gave him so many reasons why he would. He said, I'm not eloquent in speech and everything else. And God had to get mad with him, finally. And he said, You're going to do this, and I'll provide you with a speaker since you wanted to say that you couldn't do it. How much better would it have been if Moses just simply said, like Caleb, Oh, yeah, you said I should do it? then I'm doing it because I know that you can do it. But he gave every excuse because he tried to rely on his own abilities and might. Designer clothes. How many of you have ever worn them in your life or know what they are? Everybody? 
Okay, you know designer clothes by their logo or image, don't you, a lot of times? You think that's just coincidence? The manufacturer spent tons of money in advertising and brand marketing, putting that product out there, developing an Im a logo for an image. Why? So that they could sell clothes, so that you could recognize them. You could buy their product, so that they would gain, they would profit as a company, they would survive. We have a brand image. Jesus told us right here, love one another. And that's how we would be known. Cue up one of those, Logan. What is that image? Anybody know? Somebody? Nike. Yeah, most all of you know. Why? It doesn't say it. It's a swoosh. But you know that it's Nike. So there's a successful marketing ploy that we know what their image is without a word or anything else. You know that's Nike. Whether you have a desire or not to buy it, that's the end goal of, of the manufacturers of the clothing. It's so that you'll buy that product. Same thing with if we love one another. If you love one another, buy this, all men that you'll know that, all men will know that you are my disciples. Why? So they can be reconciled to God. That was the theme of his story. It's plain and simple. Throw us up another one. What is that one? Yep, yeah, that might be a little older. I think there's set, their emblem or logo is different now. But that's what I remember because I wore my little preppy shirts. It's a Lacoste Izod, a little alligator on it. How about another one? Polo, Polo by Ralph Lauren. See, so you guys recognize it works. Wouldn't it be so awesome that if any time anybody saw each one of you, they said, Christian, they love God. They're a disciple. You know what they do? You know how they act and behave? I want to be like them. I want to purchase the product they have. Well, when you buy one of those designer clothes too, are they free? No, they're pretty costly. The more marketing they do, the more they can charge for it. Because you want that product. We want to present ourselves in such a way that people want to know who Jesus Christ is. And will it cost something? Sure it will. It will cost your time, your effort, your energy, your whole heart, not half of it. But look what the payoff will be. We already know what the story is. We went over the elements of the story. Do you remember what they were? Plot setting. Character. Theme. And what always happens in that? Conflict. So you do remember. So the characters were us, but we weren't the primary character, were we? Unlike what we may want to believe, God is the primary character. He's writing the story. The, well, not the theme, what's the, what's the plot? What was the plot? That God wanted a relationship with us. He pursues a relationship with us. The conflict was Satan, our own selves, sin. Sin is what separates us from God. So now his plot is not coming to fold because the conflict has come into the story. Setting. Setting was here on earth. That's where our setting is. But we still fight a spiritual battle on earth, not just a physical battle. We face decisions of good and evil all day long. And the theme, the overwhelming theme of the story is reconciliation to get us back to that plot that God wants a relationship with us. That's why Jesus Christ had to come. Because He's the only one that can reconcile us back. So if the story and the theme is God's love and then reconciliation, how is it going to take place unless we do this command? We're supposed to be His hands and feet to this world. If we're not doing that, He doesn't have a plan B then how are we going to draw people to Him? Where are they going to find that knowledge? Sure, the Scripture said that rocks will even cry out, but do you want a rock to cry out in your place? Or do you want to be doing it and being obedient? Just like designer clothes, we can follow the same ideas and patterns and market Jesus just the same. Not for our gain, but to draw other people to Him. And it may cost us. Here's a riddle for you. What cannot be seen, weighs nothing, is eternal, and costs Jesus everything. You don't need to answer. We're going to answer it at the end and see what you think. God created human beings to be in a 
special, personal relationship with Him. Each and every one of you. There's nothing that you've done that's too bad. There's nothing that you can ever do. He wants to have a relationship with you. And every time I think about that, it just overwhelms me. God, who is everywhere, who knows no time, who knows no boundaries of space, who knows everything, chose to have a relationship with someone like me or you. That's just overwhelming to my mind. How? Why? But He does. That's how awesome His love is. That's what He wants. And despite us, and I don't know about you, but when somebody that's under me wants to not do what I ask them to do and everything, I kind of get mad. And I'm kind of like, why should I put up with this? And not to say that God doesn't get mad. And not to say that He puts up with it. But He continues to love and pursue us passionately. So passionately that it costs Jesus His life. What will you choose to do? Will you follow Him wholeheartedly? You can choose. The characters had to choose whether they were going to write their own storylines and how they were going to write them. Whether they were going to align with the main character, with his purpose and theme, or they were going to fight against. And you might not want to think you're fighting against, but everybody will either align themselves with God for his purpose and his theme, or they'll align themselves against it. And think about that for a minute. Because you don't ever want to put yourself in that position. But if you're not fighting for Him, if you're not living a life to love one another, following His commands, being that example, telling others about Jesus Christ, then are you not fighting against His cause? Are you not hindering? And you say, well, maybe not. People that are in battle, that are sitting at home, are not necessarily doing anything. Yes, they are. The whole country is supporting their troops by what they do, by prayer, by their actions, whatever. So if you're sitting over here and just saying, well, I'm a Christian, I'm saved, I have my fire insurance, you're not supporting Him. And when somebody does look at you and sees that that's your actions and that's your God, then you're really fighting against Him. Tough to look at it that way. Okay? Jesus didn't say that we should do these things. He said, a new command I give you. I came to earth, I gave you an example. You must follow it. And by doing so, people will know that you're my disciples. I didn't say that they would come to accept Jesus Christ either. I said, they'll know your disciples. Salvation is not up to you. Don't put that burden on you. You can't force anybody to decide to do anything, let alone accept Jesus Christ as their Savior. But it says you'll be their disciple. So don't use that as a reason not to. Say, I'm not making any difference. You very well might not see any fruit from it. You might not think you're making a difference. You don't know everything, though. You don't know the same scheme that, that God knows. You don't know time, have no boundaries on time and space. But you're supposed to be obedient no matter what so that people can see that. And then... The rest is up to the Holy Spirit. It's up to God. You've been obedient. You've done what He asked you to do. And again, it's not about you. You would never bring anyone to Christ. Christ comes to them, but He does it through you if you're obedient. God's theme is reconciliation through Jesus Christ. But we're the vessel that He's supposed to use. We're the hands and feet. I googled, how many Christians in the world today are there? And this is, if you do that, this is the result you'll get. It says, a comprehensive, <clears throat> excuse me, demographic study of more than 200 countries finds that there are 2.18 billion Christians of all ages around the world, representing nearly a third of the estimated 2010 global population, 6.9 billion. Well, of course, the population has increased. Maybe Christianity has increased or not. Maybe you agree with those figures, maybe you don't. I think they're very optimistic. Because Jesus says that not all that cry, Lord, Lord, know me. And, I, and he tells them to depart from them. So the 2.18 billion is probably skewed to a positive way. But that's fine, we'll take that number. If Google is correct, then if each of us went out and by our actions, by our love for one another... 
that that result was one person coming to Christ in our lifetime, then we would double that number. There would now be 4.36 billion. Instead of two-thirds, over two-thirds of the world's population, when they die going to hell, now over half of them would be saved. Look at that difference. And what if two people in our lifetime, 2.8 times 3 is 6.4, whatever it is, out of, seven point, out of 6.9. Wow, that's 80, 90%, whatever it is. And we're not even talking about if those people that become saved become disciples of Christ. In our lifetime, if two people, because of our actions, because of loving one another, became saved, that meant there would only be a few people that when they died, they went to hell. And Jesus was clear. The Bible says, For all have sinned and shall fall short of God's glorious standard. It also says that the wages of sin is death. So if we don't go, what's the result? You fill in the blanks. Why do you think it was so important for Jesus to come to this earth? Nothing was more important to Him than God's theme of reconciliation so that souls would not perish eternally separated from God. He went through the pain and suffering that He did. He went through the mockery. He had the power at His hands and people taunted Him with it. If you are who you say you are, then have your angels come down here and save you. But what did he say instead? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He knew God's plan. He knew His theme. He aligned Himself with God. And He told us to do as He did. So if there's any questions on what love means, and Paul tells you, read 1 Corinthians 13 anytime you want. And you'll maybe agree with all the things that's there, and maybe you won't. But God's love is unconditional. It is never failing. It loves in spite of. And if we have any question, we just look at Jesus' life. So many of us say, though, I'm not called to do that. That's someone else's job. We're all guilty of that from time to time. I didn't read that in this verse. I read that we're supposed to love one another. So I challenge you today, if there is someone especially that you can think of that is hard to love, and especially if you know that they don't know Jesus Christ as their Savior, get on your knees and ask for forgiveness and for power and strength through the Holy Spirit to talk to that person. Because their life is on the line, plain and simple. So if you don't think Jesus had that commandment for you, He was talking to the disciples, right? He wasn't talking to you. Let's look at John 13, excuse me, let's look at Mark 8, 34 through 37. Then He called the crowd to Him. That's not disciples, is it? That's everybody that was there. To Him along with His disciples. So they were there. And he said, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world, yet forfeit his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his Father's glory with his holy angels. He wasn't talking to just the disciples. He was talking to everyone who claims they are a follower, a Christian. We are all called to be his disciples, his hands and feet. And he was talking to everyone. And he called them over there. If Jesus called you and said, hey, come here, i got something to tell you then it's pretty important, isn't it? He's not saying, you might just be listening to me, but you're not catching it. He said, come here, I've got something to tell you. I don't know how big the crowd was, but he said, draw close to me because this is important. And like he does many times, he repeated himself again so that you can see what his purpose is. That you are supposed to deny yourself just as he lived. Take up his cross and follow me. And if you don't, he put the consequences with it. 
that if you don't, you will lose your life. And He put the promise with it. If you do that, you will gain your life. Jesus is very clear. God is very clear in what His purpose is. It's, it's outlined for us. It's just, will we be obedient and follow it? Or will we fall to Satan's snare and Satan's lies in this world, in this adulterous and cruel generation? And will we follow our own desi- desires and dreams? It's all we see in marketing. You deserve a break today. Have it your way. Even Nike, just go for it. Right? That's what Satan is trying to tell you. That your life is much more important than God's story. So the way that you write your life story should be in not in conjunction with God, but against His, because you deserve that, right? That's not biblical anywhere. Jesus said, take up your cross and follow Him. Deny your own life. Love one another. Mark 16, 15 says this. He said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel, the good news to all creation. Go as a command, not a suggestion again. He said, Go. Where? All the world. To do what? To preach. So not only are you supposed to love one another, but when they come to you and say, Hey, what's different about you? You're supposed to tell them. You're supposed to preach. Well, I'm not called to preach. You don't ever hear me saying that I'm a preacher, but I guess that's what I'm doing, isn't it? Whether I was called to do that or not. And then it says, to all creation. Not just to the ones you like, not to the ones that's convenient, but all creation. Well, how can I do that? Acts 1.8 clears that up. It says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Again, he said, everywhere. And he said, you'll receive power. So you don't have to worry about it. God's shoulders are so big so that you don't have to bear that burden. You can't do it. There's no reason for you to even try. Put it on his shoulders. Oh, it will make your load so less heartache, so much easier to bear. And he wants you to do that. But you've got to be faithful to do it. Philippians 1, 18-21 says this, and this is Paul writing. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. You can't have reconciliation if you don't have someone to be the reconciler. I don't know if that's a word or not, but it works for me. And because of this I rejoice. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice. For I know that through your prayers and the help given by the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now as always Christ will be exalted. in My body, whether by life or by death, and then I love this verse, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. He figured it out. And if you read more of Paul's words, he wasn't a righteous, godly man. And he did a lot in his past. He persecuted and killed Christians. He didn't just live a life that was unglorifying to God. He literally put Christians to death in the most horrific ways. And now he's preaching that same gospel. And he's saying that no matter what happens to me, my life is Christ. And if I die doing it, I'm victorious. I have victory, not defeat. No one can defeat me because if I die, I will be victorious. I will spend eternity in heaven. And not only that, he'll be getting well done, my son. I mean, that's cool. Matthew 5, verses 14 through 16. Jesus is talking to the crowd again, not to the disciples. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men, that they may see your good deeds and praise your fathers, your Father in heaven. Evangelism, that's what Jesus was preaching, so that they could be reconciled. Not to just twelve men, but to all Christians. So if you're a Christian and you're called to love one another, you're called to preach the gospel message. 
you will either align yourself with his theme as a character or you'll try to be a more significant character and cause conflict <coughs> and not align yourselves with him. Thank you. I think it's a smoke. It's all in the air everywhere. Don't you think that's what it is? When Sherry works outside, she comes in and she's coughing and gagging. And when she doesn't, when she works inside, I never see it. When you left home, I think most of you have. Heather hasn't and Holly hasn't stuff, but most of you have left home. Did your father have any words of instruction with you? If he had a decent father, he should have. Those were last minute words of advice to give you instruction in life. Just this last little bit, because he should have taught you things. It may be something as simple as check the oil so you don't forget because you never do that. But he gives you those last minute words. Well, what were Jesus' last minute words before he left earth? You guys know it. It's called the Great Commission. It's found in what? Matthew 28, verses 16 through 20. It reads like this. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Well, Jesus takes a command a little bit further, and it took me years to realize this. I realized that we should live a life and we should preach the gospel message so that we could um, draw people to, to God. But this verse says that we're supposed to make disciples thereof too. And don't forget that. So that they can do the same thing. We're supposed to train them up. It is our responsibility. If you have, And it doesn't have to be your children. Especially the older you are, God's not done with you. Your story's not over. Caleb was an old man when he finally got to go into the promised land. After 40 years of wandering around in the desert, which he did nothing to deserve, and he didn't grumble or complain, he went to the promised land and said, um, It's time. Give me what God promised me. I know there's still giants out here and everything, but I am ready to go kick some booty. I am ready. I'm an old man, but my God hasn't changed at all. His promises haven't changed. I'm ready at my age to go fight some giants and whoop butt. Because if I do that, it shows how much more mighty my God is because I'm an old man. And you have many pearls of wisdom that you can share with the generation that's coming up. Don't forget these that are in here. Mentor them. Teach them so that they will do the same thing. Because this world, when they get out into it, will tell them that God's not important. God doesn't exist. It's your story that you're writing. Whatever they need to turn them to deceive them, and they don't even know that they're following Satan and his storyline. But that's what will happen when they go out in this world. And don't forget to pray for them. The fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. So this was a commission. What is a commission? I looked that up because I was like, hmm, what does that actually mean? Well, it can be a noun or a verb. As a noun, it means to instruct or command or duty given to a person or group of people. It can also be the group of people that are officially charged with a particular function. Okay, so as a noun, it was a command given to a certain group of people. Christians, not just the disciples. And who is that group and what are they officially charged with? Christians, officially charged with spreading the gospel message and making disciples thereof. As a verb, it means to give an order authorize, or authorize the production of something. To bring something newly produced into working condition. So it was an order... Authorized to do what? To spread the gospel message and make disciples. Something newly produced? Reconciliation. You don't have to worry anymore. That's why everybody is searching. That's why they get into drugs and alcohol and whatever things, sex, whatever things that they do, they're searching for something that will bring them happiness, peace, and joy in their life. We have all the joy, and we know it. There is hope. We're sinners. Yes, we are, but we don't have to worry. 
If we accept in Jesus Christ and His death on the cross as propitiation of our sins, then we are saved. We don't have to do anything. Our burden has been paid. Our debt has been paid. We don't face sentence for our crime anymore. We've been pardoned. Wow. We should be out fervently spreading that gospel message because we have that hope. And this is the Great Commission. So it's not just a commission. It's the great one. The best of the best. It's very important. Jesus commanded us to put our faith into action, if you want to put it that way, or our money where our mouth is, or step up to the plate, whatever way you want to term it. He was clear about it. He came to earth to live it to show us and then to die for us. And He said we're supposed to love as He loved. So what do you think the answer to the riddle is? Several things it can be. What do you think it is? Riddle again was what cannot be seen, weighs nothing, is eternal, and costs Jesus everything. A soul. So if a soul was that important for Jesus to give up His heavenly crown and come to earth and humble Himself and live a life for His creation and then die for them while they were mocking them, and God's story is love and then reconciliation when the conflict comes in, what part are you going to play in that story? How important is that story and that theme to you in your life? I don't know about you, but Jesus paid a horrific price. And I know that I cannot do the things that I should do. Paul says it. Probably the greatest Christian disciple ever. And if you read his words, we read it here. He prayed in the passage that we read that he prayed that he would be faithful and do everything. If you read more of his works, he says, Why do I do the things that I choose not to do? He still fought with it. Peter said, no way, I'm not going to deny you, Lord. And then he denied him three times. You're not perfect. You're a sinner saved by grace. But if you will let God empower you, you can do mighty things through Him. You can be a dynamic character in the story. It's up to you. Will you let God, will you let Him lead you and guide you? Will you be obedient or will you fight against Him? Let's bow our heads. Father, we thank You so much for Your Word. We thank You for Your love. We thank You for Your faithfulness. That You continue to love us no matter what. No matter if we love You half-heartedly, You still love us. No matter whether we deny You, You still love us. No matter if we wage, wage war against You, You still love us. And You loved us enough that You sent Jesus to die for our sins. Father, that is so overwhelming. And I thank You for it. And I pray each one here today is empowered by Your Spirit that they catch the meaning of the story, Your theme. That they fight valiantly like they've been fighting or today is the day that they start fighting even more. That they understand the cause. They understand the value. That human souls are on the line. And if we'll just be obedient and do what You ask us to do, Souls will be saved. That's simple, Father. We thank You for that. We thank You for being able to be a part of Your story. And we thank You for that story being able to have, instead of a tragic ending, a great ending that we can't even comprehend. I just thank You so much for that. And I pray these things in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen.